Spirit child, rushing wind, fire of God, fall within, Holy Ghost, breathe on us. Hi, 
good morning everybody. My name is Ashley Travis and we would like to welcome you all here to Missionary Grow. If this is your first time visiting, we hope that you've enjoyed it and we would like to invite you to please stop by our Welcome Center where we have a very special gift waiting for all of our new visitors. I have just a few quick announcements for you all today. Our MGBC Connections Coordinator, Mrs. Maddie Pierpoint, will be taking a temporary leave of absence until further notice. However, Mrs. Ashley Arnold has graciously volunteered to fill this role. We are always in need of volunteers in many different capacities here within the church. So if you feel that the Lord is leading you to volunteer, then please contact Mrs. Ashley Arnold. In October, our missions team here at NGBC will be traveling to Honduras. We are in need of monetary donations to help them gather all the supplies that they need to make this trip a success. If you would like to give, then you can do so by going online to missionarygrove.com, simply going through our church app, or designating funds in the offering plate. Also, mark your calendars. November 7th, we plan to host a community event, Fall Festival. More information and details on this will be coming to you soon, so please be on the lookout. However, in the meantime, we plan to host a shoe and coat drive during the month of October. We will be collecting new or gently used shoes and coats in various sizes to help our youth within our community during the cold and winter months. These donations can be dropped off right here at NGBC and they will be distributed on November 7th at the Fall Festival. For more information about this, you can contact our Community Events Planner, Mrs. Jessica Powley. And that's all of the announcements that I have for you today. So if you all would, please now stand and join us for a time of worship. Amen. Are you glad you're here today? Amen. Let's, uh, let's sing together. Let's worship the Lord. And let's enjoy His presence. Father, thank you for this group of people that love you. Uh, that are called towards you, God, that you're calling towards yourself right now, God. Thank you that they pushed through this morning, through the weather and all the other things that could have happened in their lives or they could have done, God, and they just focused on you and what you want for them. So, God, I pray that you bless them right now, and as you bless them, God, let us bless you as we sing these songs, as we think about your goodness, the power of God that rests in us, or what you're wanting to do in and through us, God. Let your name be lifted high in this place, and let us glorify you and no one else. We praise you right now in song, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together, church. Everyone needs compassion. Love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of the Savior The hope of nations the Savior he can move the mountains our god is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, Lord, fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in, Lord, now I surrender savior he can move the mountain my god is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave lord and savior he can move Say. Hey. 
Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, he can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Amen. Praise God this morning for all of those mountains that he helps us conquer. Miss Hannah's going to lead us in a song. We sang it Wednesday night. It was the first time. And it talks a little bit about the story in Matthew 14 where... Uh, Jesus walks on the water, and Matthew is the only book that records actually that Peter walks on the water as well. And during this time where seasoned fishermen are concerned about losing their life, they've they're been pulling on those oars for a long time and not making a whole lot of headway. I don't know if you've ever had any time in your life where you feel like you've been pulling on the oars and not making a lot of headway. That's where they were. They were to the point to where they were just kind of concerned if they were even going to make it across this, across the sea. Waves were tall. The wind was strong. It was a picture. You know, it's something that so many times in our lives, the forces of nature, you know, seem so much bigger and stronger than we are. And it's something that can overpower any one of us at any time, you know, when life gets to be so big and life gets to be so huge that it just seems like it's all against us and in this time when they were scripture uses the word terror filled you know they had that great fear that uh, they just weren't going to make it and suddenly Jesus came to them and then Peter being Peter so many times I shake my head at Peter and then suddenly I realize, oh, that's something I would do. <laughs> that's something I would say. That's exactly where I would stick my finger in it. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, you know, to come from this state of terror to, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out on the water. Command me to walk to. So even in this moment of terror, Peter realized that Jesus' commands to us were stronger than just, yeah, come on. But Jesus called to him and he says, come on, come on, Peter, you come to me. And, and we don't know, we can, we can study a whole lot about what, what exactly Peter was thinking. Was it about trying to do just do something that Jesus did? Was it because he wanted to prove his faith? And so many people, they talk about, well, Peter's faith failed him. <laughs> the other 11 in the boat were, 
Where was their faith? Peter wanted to be, I truly believe, he, he wanted to be with Jesus. He saw the one that he loved. He saw the one that he trusted. And, and, and the fact it was in the boat, out of the boat, he didn't care. He just wanted to be with him. Lord, if it's you, command me. Command me to come. And Jesus says, come on. And Peter, without a thought, without a moment's hesitation, stepped out on that water. Church, God calls us to do things. God calls us to be of great faith. God calls us to things that otherwise we couldn't do. Let's be a church. Let's be a people that isn't afraid to step out, that isn't afraid to do the things that he calls us to. Let's sing with him this morning.
praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. We are yours. You are ours, God. You are a faithful God. We can put our whole trust, our whole hope in you, God. You are all we have to count on and depend on. As the Lord calls you into the deep waters, as he calls you to move forward in faith in him, will you go? Will you trust your Savior? Will you trust him when he calls you to do hard things? Will you trust him and know that he's not doing it just to make it hard on you, but just to bring his self-glory, to show you that he is who he says he is, that he's mighty and he's powerful and he's wonderful and he loves you but far above what we can think or even imagine. That he wants to do exceeding abundantly greater things in you than what you even think or know. We thank you, God, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank you, God, that we know everything you do, you do out of love. And we thank you, God, that we have a God that we can serve and walk in faith and trust and hope. Lord, that we know you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us. And we give you all the praise and the glory that you so deserve. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt.
praise. We praise you, King Jesus, for giving us the ability to come to you. Lord, you reconciled the lost. You restored the broken. All of these things we just sang about. We could not get to the Father except for you built that bridge, Father. You made it across your sons back on the cross that we might know you and we might be forgiven of our sin, that we might be full of your spirit, that we might be able to rejoice in the God of our salvation, the God who has brought us to this place, but is going to carry us to places far beyond our imagination. Thank you that all that's happened within us, God, is just the beginning of the good work that you are no doubt going to complete for your glory. We worship you in the anticipation of the days ahead and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give him some praise. Amen. Amen. If you have children that want to go to children's church through the second grade, you meet in the lobby. The nursery is already in session and we'll get ready for the preached word of God right now. I know that you're, I said children's church is dismissed, and I'm used to doing that, but if you've just now showed up at the 930 service, we will take your children over there for you, but children's church actually starts at the beginning of the 930 service now, and it's called Sunday school. We have Sunday school going on right now, so they're already in there, but we have some people that will take your children over for you, Um, so If you're coming here and you want your children to go to children's church, you first take them to their classes, which all children's classes are in the old building downstairs. And when you show up to come to this service, the teachers are there, and they'll get them where they need to be. And then you go over and pick them up. Uh, Make sure don't leave them. I have four kids, and I can't handle them, so I don't need yours too. Um, I I do well uh, to handle my own. I'm just confessing my sin right now. Uh, it's been a good week, and it's the beginning of a new week, but last night, if you didn't get to come to the uh, Hope Center banquet last night, the gala, you really, gala, however you want to say it, you, uh, you missed a blessing. Uh, we raised somewhere around $30,000 last night for the Hope Center, so we praise God for that, amen, yeah. Uh, we're hoping after our expenses to clear uh, around $30,000, and, and what, praise God, last year we didn't get to have a gala and uh, because of COVID this year, a lot of them are not having them uh, because of the same reasons. But I just told our people we were going to have one. We were going to get together. We were going to sit in the same room. We were going to eat at the same table. And we were going to love each other. And we weren't going to uh, live in fear. And so we just did it. And it worked out. We had 27 tables full of ribeye steaks. That's a good deal right there, okay? Y'all should have came. I'm pumping you up for next year now, all right? Ribeye steaks and... And tools and guns and men, if you like guns, we had all kinds of stuff. But the main thing we had was uh, the ability, every dime given stays right here in Benton County, our Benton County Hope Center. And, and if you don't know this, Humphrey, we have Humphreys County men, we have Henry County men, we have Decatur County men, we, we have all around us, Carroll County men, we have all and Benton, all of us, all these counties are make up our 33 guys in the Hope Center And so we're not only changing Benton County, but the areas around us for the glory of God. So it it was just a great night. So our local businesses, and I want to say this, we live in such a a great town. Our local businesses were able to sponsor the tables and and give. And they came, the banks, the the, the factories, all of them came. And and not only do they sponsor and give, but they also, we do some work programs with them. And our guys work in their factories. So it's just such a, a beautiful relationship that we have with our community and the Hope Center. I want to encourage you, uh, when you leave from this service, a lot of times you'll be meeting some Hope Center guys. What I would encourage you to do is shake their hand uh, and introduce yourself, get their names, because this is what I want it to be. I don't want it to be Missionary Grove and a Hope Center. I want it to just be Missionary Grove. I want us to be family. 
Uh, they all sit over here because they have to. They're told to sit over here at third service. They have to sit with their families and all that. They get together. And, uh, but I want us to not have that separation like that's them, this is us. No, this is us. This is us. This is uh, our Hope Center, our guys, our family. We're all in this together. If they, if they win, we win. If, if they succeed, we succeed. If they fail, it ultimately we fail. That we're in this together. We're, we're walking hand in hand, step in step, doing this together. Uh, for our community, for these families, for these children that are suffering through this as their parents go through it. There's so many people's lives that are affected. I don't know about you, but at one time I was also addicted to a lot of things in life. And uh, it, it hurt everybody around me. It, it wrecked my world. And praise God, God saw fit to, by His Holy Spirit to bring me out of that. And that's what we do at the Hope Center. We get men full of Jesus that can break these addictions. If you understand um, drug rehab, 30-day uh, secular non-Jesus rehab is 16% effective. It do, and that pretty much tells you it doesn't work. Very few people come out alive and stay alive. But when you put Jesus, intense biblical training, good work ethic, you get 56% success rate. Now you say, well, that's not great. That's a whole lot better than 16. Amen? Uh, it actually is really good. And so we, we praise God for that. And, and we know that there's going to be a lot of success in the future. Nehemiah chapter 9, I really enjoyed preaching this in the first service. I hope that they enjoyed hearing it. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes it's just on this side of the pulpit. But... Here's what I'm going to tell you today. I'm going to tell you how good God is, what he's done for us, and what he's wanting to do again. And we'll see this in Nehemiah chapter number 9, and verse number 36, excuse me, 32 uh, through 38. Let's, let's read these verses. And now our God, the great and mighty and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of unfailing love, do not let all the hardships we have suffered seem insignificant to you. Great trouble has come upon us and upon our kings and our leaders, and the priests and prophets and ancestors, all of your people. From the days when the king of Assyria first triumphed over us until now. Every time you punished us, you were just being just. We have sinned greatly and have gave, you have gave us what we deserved. Our kings, leaders, priests, and ancestors did not obey your law or listen to your warnings in your commands or laws. Even while they had their own kingdom, they didn't serve you. Though you showered them with goodness, you gave them large, fertile land, but they refused to turn from their wickedness. So now today we are slaves in the land of plenty that you gave our ancestors for their enjoyment. We are slaves here in this good land, and the lush produce of the land piles up in hands of kings whom you have set over us because of our sins and have power over us and our livestock. We serve them at their pleasure, and we are in great misery. The people responded, in view of all this, we are making a solemn promise and putting in writing. Father, I praise you today. That you've not forgotten about us, Lord, but you know exactly where we're at and exactly what we need. God, you've blessed this group of people to come out this morning, God, and I pray that you'd bless them with the word they need for their souls today, to be equipped for the work of the ministry, to be able to go out into this world and preach the gospel to every living creature, to raise their families, to work their jobs with the joy of the Lord as their strength, knowing that you are going to provide and protect, God, all of their days because they are your children. Bless us right now. As we preach your word, God, let it come forth with power and let it be full of your spirit. Take control, Holy Spirit, of this room that everything that's done here might glorify the Father which is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life where I've been like, well, God, where are you at? God, what are you, what are you doing? Or maybe like, God, have you forgotten about me? You know, you might be praying for something or looking for something or asking God for something. And, or you might be serving God the best you can and there's something going on and you're just thinking, man, what, why, why is this happening in my life? Have y'all ever looked around and things seem to be bad or maybe less desirable? Maybe you had these expectations. Everybody ever had what we call unrealistic expectations? You expected your kids to do this and then they did this and you were upset because of it, right? 
or you expected this to happen and this to happen. You know, you just, I get in moods. I know none of y'all ever get in moods, but uh, I get in moods where I'm like, I'm just mad, you know, it's just like I'm mad. I don't even have a reason to be mad. I'm just mad. Anybody ever been in one of those moods? And, and you're like, your kids, and I talk to myself, and that's the worst part about it, because then I'm like, you're mad. I'm not mad. You're mad, and we're I'm wasting all this time talking to myself. And, and I'm like, your kids haven't done nothing. Your, your wife, God, why have you let, and, 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 and all this, just this cloud of dust, this, this mind game, all this stuff, going on and, and it seems like Israel's like God remember us like don't forget us don't don't forget the promises you made us here we are in this land and there's all this stuff but everybody else has got it God where are your children it's almost like they're trying to remind him like two weeks ago they were praising him they were standing before the congregation arms of that God you are so good and God I love you and and God and then the next week we talked about praying and they they prayed this long preacher prayer do y'all know what a long preacher prayer is like after a preacher gets done preaching, then he preaches again in the prayer when he's closing service. That's a long, I try not to do that, I promise you. I try not to preach again when I'm praying. But then they do this preacher prayer in nine, uh, Nehemiah chapter 9 where they, they pray and they recant and rehearse all that God has done. It's almost like, God, have you forgotten what, what you promised us? But the truth of the matter, God never forgets. Now, God forgets your sin because he says he cast it from the uh, east is from the west, never to be remembered again. But God has never forgotten anything. Actually, what they're doing in Nehemiah chapter 9 is they're reminding themselves of who God is. They know what God has said. They know what God has done. They've heard the word of God now, so they have this knowledge in them. And they're just rehearsing now after all that God's done. Remember all that he did for Israel and the parting of the sea and all of these things. They've rehearsed that, and now they're reminding themselves. We see in verse number 32, the first thing they say is now our God. He is our God. I want to know today, can you say he is my God, not the God, he is the God. But is he your God, our God? They are saying this with confidence. God, you are our God. Remember, they were just in a huge crowd of 40,000 people. They were praying and worshiping. and They were recanting the stories of how God had brought them out of Egypt. And there's probably people in the crowd that weren't present when all this happened. And they, they didn't know the stories. And they've heard the goodness of God. And, and now they're all saying together, our God, I want to know today, do you have the confidence within you through the Holy Spirit to say, He is my God? Amen. I like it, brother. He has set us free. He has done mighty things for us. He has, listen to me, He's done as much for us as He's done for Israel. Amen? Yeah, okay. Well, I just thought y'all might have... Went mute there for a second. You tried, but it didn't happen. But I can help you with that. And listen, I am not ashamed to amen myself if it's truth. So if I don't get some amens, I'll just go down and sit down and amen. And I'll come. It takes longer, though, so we'll be here longer. So if you'll just amen me, we'll run right through this. All right? All right, amen. There's somebody that wants to get home right now. He is our God. I hope he's your God. It's personal. It's not the God, the God that helped Israel, the God that parted the sea, the God that did this. But what is your God? What has God done for you? I last night was thinking about my wife was asleep, and I sometimes just get where I can't sleep. And so I just sit there and think and look on Facebook and all this stuff going on. But I, I was just thinking about how far my God has brought me. Like I, I look, me and my wife took a picture, we got to come to this gala, we were, we were all dressed up and, and, and having a good time and serving the Lord, but I remember 10 years ago when I couldn't even put two sentences together because I was going through the worst time I'd ever been through in my life. 
Like I remember when I didn't know if I was going to live or die. I remember laying in the floor in depression as a grown man begging God to take me out of this world because I'd have been better with him than I'd have been on. I remember those moments. And then last night I thought of all the hell that I went through on earth. This is worth going through to be where my God had saved me. My God had brought me through. My God had set my feet. Look, I don't know if he is your God, but I am proclaiming today he is my God. I have seen him move. I have seen him work. And I believe if you thought about it for just a minute, you could say the same thing. Not only is he their God, our God, my God, but it says he is great, mighty, and awesome. I don't, I don't want to serve a God that isn't God. And I don't want to serve the God of my imagination. Because most of the time, the God of my imagination looks more like me than like him. Amen? Because I make him into what I want him to be. I, I, I make him say the things I want him to say. But when the scripture describes him, uses three words right here. Now they're rehearsing who he is. Reminding themselves. Number one, he is great. He is high and lifted up. They've got a vision like Isaiah did in the, in the first chapter of the book of Isaiah. Where Isaiah had a vision of God. Everybody wants God on our level. Wants God to look like us. But when Isaiah saw God, he saw him high and lifted up. He was on his thrown in the train of his robe filled the temple. He was loud. He was, he was not a, a wimpy God. He was not a, a weak God. But he was a, a mighty God. I don't want a God that can be triumphed over or that can be troubled or, or they can't heal or, or they can't work. I want the, the God of the scripture. I don't want a weak God but I want a great God. He said he is a mighty God. Sometimes in the midst of the struggle we think how, how is this going to happen? How am I going to do this? Well, at that moment, you can say, I don't have to do this. Because your God is great. Your God is mighty. What does mighty mean? It means powerful. How many of you want a God that's all powerful? Amen. I want to serve a sissy. You understand? Look, I want a God that can actually do something. That can actually work. That can actually. And one of the. The words for mighty in the scripture here is this, a warrior. We serve a warrior God. He is destroying evil. My God is not the, and I get so frustrated. I know when we're talking about the God of love at the end, but we, we got him like some boyfriend God who is begging us to come to him because he's so heartbroken that we're out there flirting with some other girl and he's just sitting over in the corner crying because we won't come over here and serve him. We got boyfriend Jesus. The scripture don't describe him like that. My God is mighty and he pulls down strongholds. My God, in the end, comes back, listen to me, riding a horse. And he's got King of Kings and Lord of Lords written on his thigh. And he's got a double-edged sword. And he destroys all things that are not righteous. That's my God. I don't serve a God of the man's imagination, a emasculated God that the society that we live in has made him. Uh, a he, she, and, or it, them, they, or whatever the pronoun wants to be. That is not my God. He is God and there is no other. See him as strong, mighty, powerful, champion. My God has never lost. Amen. My God has never lost. And as competitive as I am, I don't like a loser, okay? Like, I can't stand to lose to my kids in checkers. I, will, I do not let my kids win anything. Their mother said, you ought to just let them win. I said, I'm not raising sissies. Like, well, put some pads on, boy. I, he's four years, I don't care. I'll knock him in the dirt, you know? Toughen up, son. World's hard. Champion. Champion. You say, well, it didn't look like a champion when Jesus died on the cross. Listen to me. God pulling the strings. The great puppet master. Everything happened in Israel. God's doing. It might look like Jesus 
got killed. I like it when people say, well, they murdered my king. Absolutely not. He said that I have the power. I will lay down my life and I will resurrect it. They did nothing to him that he didn't allow them to do. It might have looked like defeat. Satan might have thought he had won. But on the third day, he comes back from the grave in his own power. My God is so much a champion that he defeated death, hell, and the grave. That's who I serve. I don't serve a dead God, but I serve a God that says, Lazarus, come forth that in the end he will destroy all things and he will win an overwhelming victory against Satan and his forces. He is a giant. He is mighty. He is strong. He is valiant. And what he did for Israel, he can do for you. Great, mighty, powerful, awesome. You know what awesome is? It's a word that we used to use in the 90s. Man, that's awesome. It's not really the same meaning, though, for God. Awe. Being in awe of something. And it's a reference to fear. Now, listen to me. We got the mighty, powerful, strong, champion, valiant, warrior, tyrant God that we serve. He is going to win. But there's something we need to always understand. We need to have an awesome fear of the Lord ourselves. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, and the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. You say, how can you fear someone that you love? It's very simple. You didn't have my daddy, did you? (laughs) My daddy loved me, and that's why he was hard on me. I understand that now. But back then, that this hurts me more than it hurts you, I really thought that was a lie. (laughs) You know, I thought, that you're making that up. This ain't bothering you at all. <laughs> but I, I know that's true now because I don't, I don't like to whip my kids. I, I don't like to discipline my kids. It's, my flesh doesn't want to. But one day, me and my dad, I, I, was a, I, I was a smart mouth kid. As a kid, I was a good kid. But as a teenager, I was a terrible teenager. So we were standing in the kitchen. And uh, I guess I'd smarted off to my mom. And that was one thing my dad did not put up with. And he said, get out in the yard, boy. I said, I just kind of looked at and I'm 6'1", 175. I'm not a small guy, but I'm not a big guy. Get out in the yard. I said, what are we going to do in the yard? <laughs> he said, I'm fixing to treat you like a man. And he, look, he, he didn't play. I seen him take a horse by the air and beat it into the ground. He could have whooped me in a matter of seconds. 6'1", 2, you know, 175. 36 inch inseams, I wrapped my chairs around the kitchen table leg, <laughs> my leg like right here, and sat down in the floor. You know why? Because I feared my father. When you think about God, as much as we want him to just do everything we want him to do, there ought to be something inside of us that says, I need to serve him because he has the ability to do what he wants to do. Don't ever forget that. And there's the love side, multi-sided, like a diamond, multi-faceted, multi-sides. He has justice. He has grace. He has mercy. He has all of these things. And that's what they said. We messed up. And when we messed up, you punished us righteously. But you are an awesome God. We will reverence you. We will fear you. And we will love you. Because you are an awesome God who keeps your Word. I'm thankful that God is a God of His Word. It says, Now God, our God, great and mighty and awesome, who keeps His covenant of unfailing love. He is a covenant-keeping God. Israel knew this because they continually sinned against God, yet He continually loved them. How many of you have done more wrong than right in your life? I'm raising my hand. I'm going to raise both my hands. Amen? Now listen to me. This is the best part of the sermon, I promise you. Because there's always more grace. God is always 
going to love his children. And we see that in the life of Israel. God would bless them and help them and, and work in their life and, and get them out of slavery and all this stuff. And they would just go back to their sinful practices, go back to their pagan worship, go back to all these other things. Yet God would work in their life over and over because he had a covenant of an unfailing love. I'm thankful that when I continually mess up, just like my earthly father did for me, my heavenly father, when he says, I love you, he means it. I'm telling you, someone needs to hear this today. God has made a covenant to always love you through the blood of Jesus Christ. Not because you're good. The complete opposite. Because he's good and his mercy endures forever. I'm thankful that even as a pastor for 20 years, when I mess up, God still says, I love you. When I run to God and say, God, I'm sorry, I'm still thankful that God says, you are forgiven. I'm still thankful that I know that tomorrow morning when I wake up, God will not desert me. He will not abandon me. He's not going to run off. He's never going to leave me. You say, how do you know that, preacher? How do you know for sure? Two things. This is how I know this. Number one, experience. I have experienced the love of God. Now, that's kind of like a feeling. Y'all, y'all ever uh, had that feeling come over you? I mean, let me first service understood what I was saying when I when I talked about it like this. You know that that goosebump. You know what I'm talking about. You know, maybe the first time you ever felt it was like Starwood Amphitheater, Leonard Skinner, Freebird. They hit that first note, and everybody there, woo! Y'all know what I'm talking about. Nobody's ever sit in the grass but me. You know what I'm saying. That feeling. I've experienced that. That I was there. I was there. I, I've, I've, I've experienced God. I, I've experienced the presence of God. I, I've, I've been in the manifest presence of God. I've been, where, I've been where no man nor woman could stand in the presence of God. They all had to hit the ground. I've, I've been in a place... Where God's light was so bright, you all had to shut your eyes and get in a hole somewhere because you knew God was so in the room that you didn't want to even look up. You was afraid what you might see. I've seen the I've seen the move of God. I've seen the the fire of God. I've, I've experienced the the flame. That's what I'm talking. About, the feeling. I know when God shows up because His spirit and my spirit are connected. I hope you know that feeling. But sometimes feelings aren't there. And sometimes you can pray and worship and pray and worship and you still can't feel anything. Any everybody ever been there? Like a, it's like, God, where are you? Where are you? And that's when you have to rely on something more than feelings. Because listen to me, feelings are a faulty gauge of reality. Feelings are a faulty gauge of reality. I sometimes don't feel like a child of God in my sinfulness or in my state that I am. But there's knowledge that I have. And this is what's going to take us through, church. It's going to be the knowledge. We experience God, but when we can't experience Him and feel Him, we have the knowledge of what He has said, and that will carry us through the unfailing love of God. Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8, and let's start in verse number 28. And we know, knowledge, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those, that's us, those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. And now listen, when you read these verses and you're a child of God, read them for yourself. I like that, y'all and them and us, but I'm talking about me, for God knew me in advance this is you God chose you to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many others that are sitting in this room right now and having chosen me he called me to himself and having called me he gave me listen get it down to the personal level and have some knowledge if you can't feel it you know God called you you know God saved you you know 
God gave you right standing. And you know God gave you His glory, which is the Holy Spirit. What shall we say then? If God would do all of this and choose us and call us and fill us and overflow us with who He is, what can we say to such wonderful things as these? If God be for me, who can be against me? If God can be for me, who cares who's against me? Since he did not spare even his own son, but he gave his own son up for me. Won't he also give up everything else? Everything. He will give us everything. Who dare accuses you? Who God has chosen? No one. God gave you right standing. Who will condemn you? No one. Who will listen to me? There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Jesus Romans chapter 8 verse number 1 who then will condemn us no one for Christ Jesus died for you raised to life for you and is sitting at the place of the right hand of God in honor pleading for you if you don't remember anything else today you remember this can anything separate you from Christ's love does it mean listen to me Does it mean he no longer loves you if life happens? That's what that ought to say. Amen. If life happens. Because that's life. Life is a whole bunch of downs and a few ups. This is what we're going to deal with. Does it mean God don't love you if you have trouble or calamity? If you have persecution? If you're hungry? If you're destitute? If you're in danger? Does it mean he don't love you? Does it mean he don't love you if somebody's threatening to kill you? Does it mean God's not there? Where are you, God? What are you doing, God? As the scripture says, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is yours through Christ who loves you. Overwhelming victory. And here's what I could tell you. Romans 8, 38 and 39. I can tell you this from experience. If Paul didn't write it, I could have. I wouldn't have said it near as good. But this is my life right here. This is what I believe fully. The word of God settled in heaven. I am convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Neither death. Now look at this. This is a comprehensive list. If you think you can run away from the love of God, if you think you can escape the love of God, if you think you can get away from the love of God, if you think that you can go off and leave the things of God, listen to me. Nor life, nor death. That pretty much covers everything. Wouldn't you say? All right. Let's keep going. Nor angels, nor demons. Think about it. Fears of today, plenty of those. Or worries of tomorrow. Powers of hell, nope, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Powers in the sky, earth below, nothing, nothing. What does nothing mean? Nothing. Nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God That is revealed. What does revealed mean? That means you really could see this. If you ever doubted God loved you. The way God showed you and proved it. Romans chapter 5. That while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. The revelation of God's love is in the giving of his son. I hope you've experienced but more than that. If you turn back to Nehemiah. They talked about great trouble. And oh how we've been punished. And how we didn't obey and how we didn't serve and we're slaves because of our own doing and the enemy around us seems to prosper despite all of the stuff you see going on around you God is here God is now and he still has an unfailing love for his people so take your eyes off of everything else and put it on the cross put it on the cross that's proof right there That God loves you, that he always has, and that he always will. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Listen to me. This is what 1 Corinthians tells you. You are pressed on every side by troubles, 
but you will not be crushed. You are perplexed, but you will not be driven to despair. You are hunted down, but you will never be abandoned. You will get knocked down, but you will not be destroyed this morning. Know that God loves you. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray. And if you haven't felt it lately, if you've had a hard time, if you just need to bask in the love of God, if you want to come to these altars, if you just want to say, Lord, thank you for what you've done, for whatever you need this morning, I'm going to pray. And as I pray, I just want you to come to these altars and say, thank you for your love or help me feel your love. Whatever that need is. He tells you, do not worry about anything, but pray about everything. Bring it to me. Lay it at my feet. I will take this burden. I will do this for you. I will help you. I will work in your life. I will meet the needs that you need me to meet. Let me pray for you. And you come to this altar. Some are already here. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, God, that your goodness is being seen in this place. That your love, your mercy, and your grace is being felt. That everything you want from us right now, God, is just what you're already pouring in. And God, if there's one in this room that feels less than love, that God, the knowledge of what you've said today will overtake their feelings. That they will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love them and you proved it to them by putting your son on an old rugged cross. God, let us know these things today. In Jesus' name. People pray. You pray too. You're going to make it. You're going to mend. You're going to heal. Your heart's going to be all right. God's going to help you. Your mind can be helped too. Those thoughts, those anxieties, those fears, those troubles in you, God can help those too. God's working on your behalf to do in the will of His good pleasure the work that He began in you. He is no doubt going to finish. He loves you with a never-ending, unfailing love. Never leave you, never forsake you. Be with you unto the end of this age and for all eternity. Christ has gone to prepare a place for you. He's going to come back and get you. That where, where He is, you can be also this world is just for a minute life is like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away Romans chapter 6 says but our light affliction listen to me our light affliction is momentary but is working for us a far greater weight in glory hear that again your light affliction Whatever you're going through on this earth and however long you go through it until you get to glory. Your light affliction. You say, how does Paul say light? You know what he, he compares our affliction to? What Christ went through. Your light affliction compared to what Christ went through. For your salvation is but momentary. Yet God is working in you. Everything. First Peter chapter 5. Listen to me. This is working the grace in you. Everything that's happening is the grace of God in you, making you more like himself. James chapter number 1. Listen, listen to the word of God. We count it all joy, my brothers, when we go through these trials and tribulations. For the working of our patience, the working of what's in us, being worked out of us, brings us to a place of perfection in him. Trust Him. He loves you. Everything that's happening is for a reason. He's in the redeeming business. And I promise you this. The end is going to be greater than the beginning. Father, we thank you for this moment of healing from your scripture. To set our minds straight with what it says. God, help us not to live on feelings alone but on the knowledge of Christ. And may everyone in this room be lifted up. May they have the joy of the Lord as their strength and the confidence to walk the walk you've given them, to live out the calling on their life. 
for the glory of the King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Just got a few announcements before we leave. Don't forget we got a coat and shoe drive or a shoe and coat drive. We've got a fall festival coming up the first Sunday evening in November. We're going to bring all those things in the month of October. We're going to invite the whole community to the fall festival. We're going to feed everybody. We're going to put clothes on people's back and shoes on people's feet. Get ready for that. Also, don't forget your offering as you leave. Put them on the, on, on the boxes in the back wall. Is that all we got for today? All right, let's stand up and be dismissed in a word of prayer. Don't forget your kids. Tuesday night. We're going to have community prayer here, revival prayer. If you believe that prayer moves mountains, come here Tuesday night. And then Monday night, CR. Monday night, Jonathan Bailey will be giving his testimony of how God brought him out of death and alcohol into the glorious life that God's allowing him to live now. So, so Monday nights are cool. If you had not ever been a part of CR, you would enjoy that. Tuesday night, prayer meeting, Wednesday night church. Look, I got your week planned for you. Just show back up. We'll have something going on. All right, Father, thank you that you've always got something for us to do. May we be productive. May we be kingdom workers. May we go out and see the lost saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in grace. We love you. Thank you for being here today.